I usually make toys on my 3D printers, but this time I'm making a very practical print. A watering pan. Good morning, everybody. It's Stephen here for Bland Designs and the Idiot Quilter, and welcome to my weekly vlog for Monday, June the 20th, 2022. Vlog number 268, and it's day 332 of COVID. So let's get right into what I've been making. I'm really excited about this project. It took me a while to do, like pretty much all of last week, but I got it finished and it was well worth the effort. And I'm going to just put it up here so you can take a look at it. And this is it. It is called a the what's it called it's called feather jungle it is by sweet pea designs it is a table runner and this was all done in the hoop it's in the hoop embroidery and you know how much i love in the hoop embroidery and applique of course but all done in your embroidery machine and i think it turned out really nice and it looks really nice on my table in my kitchen area um I ran into a couple of problems with it, but I overcame those. Uh, and if you've been thinking about doing something like this, if you have an embroidery machine, but you've never tried in the hoop uh, embroidery, um, I really enjoy it. But a pattern like this is not for somebody who's just getting started out because you'll be very, very frustrated. Um, I've done a lot of in the hoop uh, embroidered type projects, and uh, I've learned a lot in doing that. So yeah, this one, Although time consuming wasn't that difficult. The most difficult part about it was really picking my colors. Um, but I think it turned out really nice and I'm really happy with it. And this is definitely something that you wouldn't really put pots and pans and dishes and things on it because although I'm, you could wash it, I don't want to take a chance on it. Um, and I don't want to take a chance of it getting stained either. So it's there on my table just for a decorative purposes. And sadly, that's all I was able to get done last week. I didn't work on anything else much um, because that took up all my time as well as my 3D printers, uh, which are giving me some problems, but more about that when I come to that segment in today's um, vlog. Okay, so that takes me to, speaking of 3D prints, um, I've had people ask me various questions about you know they'd like to get into 3d printing but they don't know where to start um and then they but one of the questions they really have is so what can you make with it and by that nature of that question i think what people are asking is can you make things that are practical and useful not just little statues figurines decorations toys that kind of thing well yes you can however there are mm, some tricks involved. It depends on what you're making. Uh, it depends on the materials you're making it from. There's a lot of factors go into that. But luckily we have YouTube and YouTube has a lot of excellent informational videos as they always do that can help you out with this decision, especially if you're brand new to 3D printing. So I thought I would uh, just review um, a playlist that I found of useful 3D prints. If you're into 3D printing, you probably have come to a point where you're not really sure what you're making is just a toy or is actually something very practical. And yes, you can make a lot of toys with your 3D printer, but you can also make a lot of practical household everyday items. And where do you find a list of these? Well, Go to YouTube and look for 3D, useful 3D prints playlists, as I'm showing here. And so you can see there are quite a few of these. Uh, oftentimes, makers who have YouTube channels for 3D printing will put up a list every now and then of things they have been making that are very, very practical. And you can also find in this list uh, things like 50 money-making things. So if you want to start a business or things you can print in an hour or less, or whatever. There is quite a variety here. And oftentimes when I'm stumped for something that I want to print on my 3D printer, 
Uh, I will go to a list like this and I will find all kinds of ideas I never thought of before. Usually within these videos as well, they will have a link to a site where you can pick up a model. Sometimes, most of the time they're free. Sometimes they might be uh, paid for kinds of models. But no matter what, you're going to find a lot of variety here and a lot of ideas. So why not just check out useful 3D prints as playlists and see what you can create today. So you'll find a link for that particular playlist and there are many uh, in the show notes below. There's a link for Stephen and Walter live and uh, because it's June, it's Pride Month, yada, 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 and that kind of thing. Uh, we've been talking a little bit about the... Um, I want to call it the rainbow community because the letters are just getting too long and too confusing anymore. So under the rainbow community, and somebody asked us a week ago, um, how did my parents take it when I came out to them? And that got me thinking about the whole coming out process. And if you're not part of the rainbow community, the coming out process is probably something that's a bit of a mystery for you. Um, you know, you hear about celebrities and athletes uh, in the last little while who are all coming out to great fanfare. Yes, I am gay. Yes, I am lesbian. Yes, I am transgendered. Yes, I am non-binary. All that kind of stuff. And there's a whole bunch of hullabaloo about it because, you know, they're famous and they're coming out. Well, you know, you don't have to be famous to come out. But it is a process. And it is a very complicated process and it is an ongoing process. You just don't come out one day and that's it. It's a lifetime process. So we discussed our coming out stories, for lack of a better term, uh, yesterday. So if you're interested in that, then check out Stephen and Walter Live. And there's a link for that in the show notes. There is a link for last week's Idiot Quilter. I called it so many things because it was. It was a mishmash of all kinds of different things I've been working on and projects and, and other things there. And there is a demo. I put made another demo. It's about creating a quilt block using the uh, In the Hoop or ITH uh, applique technique. Um, it isn't about making this particular project I just showed you, the Feathered Jungle. It's about another one that, well, you actually can see it hanging over my left shoulder. Uh, up there on my bookcase. It's not done yet. I still have about four or five more blocks to do and uh, I just haven't got around to them yet but I should and that'll eventually become a wall hanging but I thought I'd show you how I go about making one of those blocks and basically the techniques I show you in that video are the techniques that are pretty standard for any in the hoop project including the feathered jungle table runner that I showed you. And there is a link to an interview with Lynn Reinhardt of Cotton Arts Studio. And uh, Lynn is somebody that I used to follow quite a while, for quite a while when I first got into quilting, uh, when she had Stitch TV. Um, so if you're interested in that, you'll find the link for that interview in the show notes below. And there's also our latest So Chatty, episode 63. Um, we talk about Christmas planning. Yes, never too soon. For that kind of thing. I mean, after all, we were only six months away from Christmas Day. I know it's scary to think, isn't it? Where's this year going? You know, quite frankly, as an aside, I was just thinking this morning, 2022 has not been a good year. It might be a little better when it comes to COVID, but it's been a lot worse when it comes to the financial situation of the world, the economy, all that kind of stuff. So yeah, maybe when 2022 is over, maybe 2023 will be better. Don't we say that all the time about every year? Um, there's also all kinds of information and links for the International Stitch Marathon that takes place on July the 22nd and uh, just a little bit more about that near the end of today's vlog. So that takes me to uh, what's outside my window today. Just let me get the picture up that I took and here it is. Looks like it's going to be a nice day. Uh, looks like it's going to be sunny. Uh, right now, the temperature is at 16 degrees Celsius, which is comfortable. Um, not hot, but comfortable, but it's rising. I don't know what today's high is going to be, but, you know, everything's looking nice, nice and green, the whole bit. Nice, uh, well, actually, tomorrow is the first day of summer.
here in the Northern Hemisphere, the calendar date for it anyways. It's also the longest day of the year tomorrow, the 21st of June. So yeah, looks like it's going to be a nice one today. And I'll probably stay indoors all day to fix the problems I'm having with my printers. More about that in a moment. But in the meantime, so let's talk about dental work, okay? Now, I know this is not a topic that everybody likes to talk about, but it's something we've all had to deal with in one form or another. I mean, our teeth are important to us, right? And uh, so, you know, usually we have regular checkups and cleanings, at least I do, and uh, because I do not want to end up with teeth like my parents had. And Walter recently, as you know, has just gone through a bunch of dental surgery and stuff like that, and it is pricey. And a lot of people don't go to the dentist mainly for one reason, one reason only. Money. Yes, we do have a fear of the dentist. I do. I do not like going to the dentist. I had a bad experience when I was a little kid, my first visit to a dentist. And needless to say, it was a torture chamber. And even though today modern dentistry is, for the most part, fairly painless, um, it's still, you know, I get in that chair and I just clench um, because of what happened to me as a kid. But that's not what my point is. My point is the other fear we have, and that is the great cost of dental work. I mean, I swear, the professions in the world that you want your children to get into or you should have been into if you want to make big money are lawyers, doctors, and dentists, for sure. Um, we go to a very good dentist. He uses the highest tech equipment. Um, his office is extremely streamlined, professional, well done, uh, expensive looking. I mean, I'll grant you, dental equipment is probably very, very expensive. And the more people you have working for you, the more money you have to pay out. So it is a business. There's no two ways about it. But let's get real. The cost of dental care is horrendous. We have insurance. We pay for the insurance. But even it only covers, in general, 85% of your dental care costs. So when I go in for a cleaning, um, I have to pay something, um, 85% of it I get back, but dentists all charge more than what is recommended by their dental society or whatever, their regulatory body, which really doesn't regulatory, regulate anything. Um, and prices for dentists do vary. I mean, you can shop around. I mean, here's an example of what I mean. So, a couple of weeks ago, Walter had to have um, a dental surgery done. Uh, he had a tooth that needed to be pulled. Our regular dentist uh, didn't do it successfully, and he didn't want to play around with it. So, he sent Walter to a dental surgeon, and the dental surgeon was able to get out what was left of the tooth to get out and everything like that. Well, he only charged Walter for that $235. I say only, but you know, still. And uh, so that was fine. And of course, as I said, part of that was covered by our insurance as well. But he put in a temporary filling because then we have to go back to our regular dentist. or Walter had to go back to our regular dentist to have that permanently filled. He had appointments scheduled for that down the road. But in the meantime, the temporary filling fell out and he moved the appointment up. So he got in there. The dentist spent less than five minutes filling the tooth with a permanent filling. He didn't have to use any freezing or anything because this was a tooth that Walter had a root canal done on as well. So it was basically dead. Um, so no nerves. Five minutes. 380 some dollars. For this filling when walter questioned that well that wasn't a regular filling it was a core something they had a fancy name for it. so the filling was more than what walter had done by the dental surgeon actually i told you it was for pulling out that tooth no it was another thing he also had to go for a root canal so that's what the temporary filling was for there and 
our insurance only covers 50% of that, not 85, because they consider that some other kind of procedure. There's always loopholes in all of these things, right? But my God, dentists are taking you to the cleaners. When I go in for my cleaning every nine months in my checkup, um, they try to convince me that I should be coming in every six months. When Walter was in to have this uh, permanent filling, filling put in last week, they try to talk him to coming every four months. Our insurance only covers every nine months. Um, but yeah, does one really, if you look after your teeth, you brush regularly, and I do, after every meal, and if you floss regularly, and I do, after every meal, I'm a fanatic about it, do you really need to go every four months for uh, a cleaning? And cleanings are not cheap. I mean, last time I had a cleaning and a checkup, it cost well over $300, 85% of that covered by my insurance that we pay so much out, 100, 100 and some odd dollars every month for. So, you know, and then they try to sell you other products when you're in there, other things. Well, you know, you have your teeth whitened. Um, I asked about that once, about getting my teeth whitened. Not that they're bad, but you know, everybody has dazzling smiles these days. Well, yeah, in order to do that, uh, they'd want to check, possibly get veneers and stuff like that. Ka-ching, ka-ching, ka-ching. No, you're upselling me. This is exactly what I'd expect if I was to go in and buy a new car or a used car. They would do the same thing. So dentists aren't any different. And of course, in our country, we do not have a universal dental care program. I mean, we have a health care one that the government pays most of whatever we need. If you need a heart transplant, you know, no problem. Government pays for it. Um, but not your teeth. Now, our government right now has been under pressure to start looking into creating uh, a nationwide health care or a dental care system. However, they just made an announcement saying, uh, yeah, we kind of didn't expect it was going to cost that much, which really is code for, forget it, you're not getting any time soon. Um, also, I can't help but think that the Dental Association lobbies the government for this. They don't want that kind of thing because that's going to eat into their profit line because the government will regulate put regulations on what they can charge. And right now, they just have guidelines from their own self-governing association. So yeah, that would eat into the money they need to pay for their Mercedes-Benz and their nice houses and their great vacations and everything like that. I'm sorry, but people who go into dentistry are not in it to help people. And you've heard me say this before when it comes to doctors and it comes to lawyers and it comes to politicians. They're in it for the money. They're in it for themselves. And they've got us by the curlies, don't they? Because we need their services. And they just keep trying to sell us more and more of that. And even if we were to get a nationwide dental thing with a certain amount of regulations, there will probably be loopholes in there for the dentists where they can charge above that amount. So essentially, the government will pay for, like my insurance, a certain portion of it. And the rest you're going to have to pay out of pocket. And that just means the dentists will put up their prices and because they don't want to lose any money. Do I have respect for dentists? No, I don't. I'm sorry, I don't. There's something that I need, but I do not have any respect for them because they are no better than a used car salesman. Maybe you agree with me. Maybe you don't agree with me. But that's my experience. Okay, so moving on, let's talk about what I got new this week. Well, I didn't really get anything new, but um, because of a lot of things that I have bought over the last couple of years, especially during COVID, when we, um, you know, we're all buying online, and I've gone to the world of plastic in terms of paying for my purchases online. Actually, I pay for everything now in my life with my credit card. I pay my credit cards right off, but the reason I do it is solely for the points. And there are a lot of points to be had. 
well, I've been saving up my points for something special. And on my particular credit card, I can get gift certificates for all kinds of different businesses and things like that. Well, my birthday's coming up next month. And we haven't been out to our favorite restaurant in, well, since pre-COVID. And it's it was already a relatively expensive evening out at this restaurant, which is called The Keg. The Keg is a steakhouse. They have great steaks. They have great everything in there. Service is excellent. The atmosphere is excellent. The food is excellent. Everything. We love it. And it's an excellent price, meaning, yeah. Now that uh, businesses are back up and running again, you know the prices have all gone up and we're expecting that the cake has gone up as well because being a steakhouse, it was already expensive, right? So I thought, well, we want to go out and usually, you know, we take each other out on our birthdays, you know, pay for dinner kind of a deal. Um, and I didn't really want Walter to have to pay for dinner um this time for me because Walter's already given me some really nice gifts that's just the kind of guy he is and they've been expensive throughout the year um so you know I don't want him spending more money on me kind of a thing um it makes me feel guilty so for my birthday I'm taking us out for dinner and I was able to get three hundred dollars worth of keg cards to use that night we're pulling out the stops that evening we're having before dinner drinks we're having a nice bottle of wine maybe two <laughs> for dinner probably not two because you know don't want to come out of their sloshed but we're going to have a nice dinner and not worry about the cost um yeah three hundred dollars sounds like a lot of money it'll add up really quick at this restaurant uh but you know we're going to splurge, have a little fun with it. Um, and yeah, it ate into my points. I think I had 56,000 points. But each one of these $100 keg cards uh, cost me 14,000 points. So you can do the math. What's that? Over 20, let's see, 28, 42,000 of my points went to these three cards. But through points, it's basically free. So it'll be a free night out, pretty much. And I'm looking forward to it. I'm just looking forward to going out and eating in a nice restaurant um, as well. I'm still a little apprehensive about that, but we've been slowly getting used to the idea uh, with the not wearing masks and things. Although we went to a Costco on the weekend. They just opened a new one here in our city. And uh, we decided to go up there and we went in, we had our masks in our pocket, but nobody was wearing a mask. It didn't seem. But then when we were inside, we were looking around and some people were in masks, some weren't. And to be honest, the people that weren't wearing the masks, I really think should have been wearing a mask. Uh, we just, we both looked at each other and said, nope, putting on our masks. Better safe than sorry uh, with it. So anyways, yeah. So that's all I bought this week. Um, I do have on order some 3D printer parts, um, but more about that in a second. So, in fact, that's what we're going to talk about right now. Um, so, I, let's see, do I have a picture of this? Yes, I do. Okay, so, you heard me talk about um, 3D printing in terms of, if you're just getting into a practical prints and things like that so i decided to make another i've made it before watering can um i have a model for that and it's worked out really well now why am i making another watering can well because somebody used my watering can that i used for my philodendrons that i have been sprouting and growing since covid started and i have like a lot of them right now it's become a hobby growing philodendrons only plant I can't kill. Um, but somebody took the little watering can that I made specially for that and left it outside uh, on the deck when it rained because he was watering his container garden with it. Okay, that's fine. But there's something you need to know 
about 3D printed products, especially if you're going to use them with water. First of all, not all prints are watertight. This particular one of the watering can is. But because I use something called PLA, PLA is basically made from cornstarch. Yeah, believe it or not. Um, it can break down. It is not good in direct sunlight for long periods of time. UV can just, um, cause it to break down. And it's not good to have water sitting in it or all over it for long periods of time because it can soften the plastic as well. That's just one of the pro uh, properties of it. So I wasn't happy that this had been left out in, you know, heavy rain and everything. It was fine. It wasn't out there long enough. But I thought, okay, I'll make you your own watering can that you can sort of leave out there. I mean, it, if it, if this one gets wet, it's made out of PLA as well. It's not going to like just dissolve quickly. It'll take a long time for it. So I printed this thing and I had a problem with it. And I'll show you what the problem was I had with it. There it is with the flower sticking in it. And I'll come to why it's got flowers stuck in it right now. So there's the watering can, the bright red one. Looks pretty good in the whole bit. And it's pretty much useless. Let me just blow it up here. Oops, that's not what I wanted. There we go. See this little line right across here? For some reason, at that point, the 3D printer did something it shouldn't have done, and I've got a gap there. So that means this is no longer watertight. Also, it has weakened the print which means even if it was watertight, you filled up with water, there's a good chance that that part of the print would come apart and water everywhere, right? So basically, after about a day of printing this thing, it's useless for its intended purpose. However, I thought, well, I'm not throwing it out. I'm not going to waste it. I will just use it. So out on our, our in our patio area, I thought it would look good sitting on this table with some flowers in it. Those are fake. <laughs> Dollar store flowers. Um, wouldn't be enough light to put real flowers in it under our deck because it's fair, kind of dark under there. Um, but it looks okay there. And, oh, by the way, as an aside, I made that little vase too. That one turned out pretty good. This is several weeks ago. And uh, I just... Didn't know what to do with it. I was doing it as an experiment to see how it would turn out because the little ridges that are on it are actually like stick out from the side of it. And yeah, things like that when you print them are sometimes a hit and a miss whether they'll work. So I thought, yeah, put some fake flowers in it. What the heck? So it looks very attractive out there, the two of them. But yeah, there's a practical print for you. But then this was actually... um an indication that there was a problem with my printer. And that's what I want to talk about now. You know, 3D printing is a wonderful hobby. Um, I've told you before, you need to tinker with it. You've got to be the kind of person who enjoys tinkering with electronics because it can be very, very frustrating. They are not plug and play. Okay, you have to play with them. And so I have been, and you know I own three of these things, and I'm having problems with two of them. One of them, I think I know what the problem is, easy to rectify. But the other one, I haven't got a clue. I have done all kinds of things to it. I have replaced parts in it, and I'm still having the same problem. I have one avenue left that I can think of to try, and I'm going to try that later today and see if that solves my problem. I mean, there's not a whole heck of a lot that can go wrong with these things. Well, no, let me back up. Yeah, there is a whole lot of things that can go wrong with them. But in terms of mechanical parts or how they work, they're a very simple device in most ways, barring the computer component of it. But most of it is mechanical. The computer just tells the mechanics what to do. So nine times out of 10, if you're having a problem, you're having a problem because there's something mechanically wrong with it. And so you need to fix or replace a part. Now, parts for 3D printers are not that expensive, given, you know, what, what, you're, what they are. Um, and I tend to stock parts because I'm constantly replacing parts. 
So I have just ordered a whole bunch of parts. Now, usually I buy my parts right on Amazon, but there is a place here in Canada, actually in my province called 3D Printing Canada. And they stock pretty much anything you need for any printer. So I went in there. I've never ordered from them before. Um, but I went in there yesterday to check on a couple of things that I wanted. And their prices were pretty good. In fact, on a couple of the parts, their prices were lower than Amazon. And these are original parts, not third party. As far as I know. Uh, for my printer. So I ordered a bunch of stuff yesterday. Um, actually, they're not ordered. They're, they're there for future repair jobs. I like to stockpile parts for these things. So, yeah. Um, if you're thinking of buying a 3D printer, be prepared for this. I don't want to scare you off from it, but it's not a question of, well, I just paid $300 for a 3D printer and that's it. I won't be having to spend any more money on it except for a filament. No, you will have to buy parts. You will. And although the parts are not that expensive, it adds up. So later today, I'm going to see if I can fix this sucker, figure out what the problem is. I know it's something simple. I do. But I'm at a loss. But I will work it out. Okay. So that takes me to blasts from the past um, in terms of trips. This is part three of the Barossa Wineries uh, tour that we took in February of 2018. So we will go inside. Looks like the tasting's back there. Yeah. That's a wine cat. Maybe the bus too. Oh, maybe. Twin pickings, but those are musca uh, moscatos. I don't, uh, like I don't like moscatos. Pinot Grigio. Mm -hmm. There you can get a three pack. Uh, it's a rose, Sauvignon Blanc, and something else. And Pinot Grigio, but it has a rose in it. $200. Oh, $200? Oh, let's go for it. Oh, look. Yeah. Wow, you spoke too soon. I know. I always do. Okay, so let's go around here to find types. Little bottles. Four classic series of Shiraz, Cabernet, Sauvignon Blanc, Chardonnay, and Merlot. This must be the restaurant. How are we doing? Hi, good. That's good. You mind if I take video? No, I spoken to. That's fine. So, what do you want to try? I don't know. What do you want? Well, this sounds interesting. The sparkling Shiraz. Well, I don't know. How would I don't? If it doesn't say you have to try it. See. You got reserved Chardonnay. Nice. Hi. How are you going? Yeah, there's a couple we'd like to try. Um, with the Pinot yeah, Noir. Yeah. Give you a pencil. You want to go through and tick the ones yeah. that you would like to try? Oh, sure. So, so you can try four for three. You can do the video. Or 
Yeah, you're on camera. <laughs> you have the uh, sparkling trash that you can try? Yeah. Okay. So it's on there. And, uh, try the double barrel Shiraz. And uh, what else? What about the, where was it? Mm, not the Muscat. It was one of your ones. Yeah, the cool okay. harvest. Try that. Nice. So can I? Uh, yeah. 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 You can tell by our accent, eh? It was the, <laughs> just, it was just the, one glass. Cause <laughs> that's what I'm having away. Yeah. Just. So sparkling Chardonnay Pinot Noir. Just the one glass. Well, just just the one yeah, glass. because he's driving. So. Do you want a little taste? At all? I'll try a little bit. So similar methods and styles as creating a French champagne. You notice that main characteristic in there is um, Granny Smith apple. That's nice. Yeah. Did we have that on the list? Sure. Yeah, right there. We'll get that one. Oh, okay. So yeah, I didn't realize it was sparkling. It's actually, that's nice. Yeah. Don't get too bad. Yeah. No, I know. See, we can only in Canada where we live. There's only about a couple of your wines that we can get because yeah. we buy them all the time. So you probably get. Well, you yeah, we don't like Muscat. But we don't like those ones. Like we don't like Muscat. Yeah, yeah, Chardonnay yeah. and. Uh, Pinot Noir Sparkling. Yeah. Yeah, the. Um, and sparkling. there's uh, something else, I can't remember. There's only about four. Yeah. So I think we sell this one to you guys in cans. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, you can actually do have that in cans, yeah. 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 <laughs> Canned wine, okay. Yeah. okay Seems so. ridiculous, but. Yeah. <laughs> like, you finished with that one? Yeah. Yep. So everything you don't want to finish? So yeah. Just do the oh, wine okay. Yep. All right. Cool harvest Pinot Grigio. So cool harvest means harvested in the cool of night. So around two, three, even four o'clock in the morning, um, just to, so we retain that acidity. So during the day, the grapes get quite warm. The sugar level goes up, the acidity level drops. Um, so at night time, that all has time to restore. Um, yeah. We've got the acidity back. So um, we can make a nice crisp wine. Yeah, I like that one. Yeah. Okay. So you want to yeah. see Dump that in there. Next, the double barrel Shiraz. So 18 months in French and American oak barrels, and then just under three months in whiskey barrels. What that whiskey barrel does is kind of impart its own little bit of flavor in there. It also um, gets in there and smooths it out. So it's a very nice, rich wine. Yeah, I was going to say, it's very smooth. Yeah. It's good. So you notice how young this is as well, 2016. Mm. Um, so incredible aging potential. Yeah, it's very dry too. Very nice. Like it's not each. And then... Yeah. Okay. So and the last one, sparkling Shiraz, also known as Christmas in a glass over here. <laughs> we love drinking red wine all year, um, but you know during our summers it gets pretty hot, so we like a nice refreshing, a little bit of sweetness, um, sparkling red. I've never tasted one like that before. That's See when it hits? That's interesting. Yeah, I know. Really nice kind of cherry yeah. flavors. In yeah, there. it is. Yeah. That's good. That sweetness kind of picks up those fruity characteristics. In the okay. Way. That's great. So if we want these. You can purchase them for me. Okay. okay. We want one of each. One of each? Yep. Sure. Thank you. So, as you saw there, we bought four bottles, which are four bottles of Jacob's Creek that we cannot get. Oh, 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 oh. Oh. In 300 meters, make a U-turn. So, as we said, as a car just about tried to back into us, we bought four bottles of wine there that we cannot get in our area in Canada. And one of them is a sparkling red, which tastes, they call it their Christmas wine, but it's got a very interesting flavor to it. It's kind of sweet, kind of cherry-ish in the background. So, of course, we got a bottle of that to try as well, because we do enjoy the sparklings at times. So now we're off to something called Chateau, what's it called? Yolanda or something. 
Chateau Yolanda or something. We have no idea what this is. Whatever. So this will be a magical mystery tour. Still in the wine country. Just some interesting scenery, all the vineyards. I swear, the only colored car they drive in Australia is white. Maybe all the rental cars are white. Maybe. <laughs> Driving at 159 Herman Thumb Drive on the left. Going for cellar door, I guess. So it's... Somewhere down No, it doesn't. Well, maybe we need to rethink yeah. this. It looks like they're under construction or something. Or no, I guess that's where their vats are. Maybe you have to go down. Maybe there is a big parking lot there or something. be their manufacturing facility. Or wait, maybe it's right in here. Well, that looks a little bit better. So, the chateau looks a little bit more impressive. So we bought two bottles here, one bottle of white, and then we bought a, bought a bottle of red, but it's a ganache, and I had never heard of ganache before. So we tried it. It's kind of a light tasting, sipping red kind of a wine, and apparently this place, it's pure ganache. Other place you'll see it, they said is GSM, which is a blend of that with a couple of other grapes and so we got that so now we have six bottles of wine and that's plenty right now um, since it'll be enough to take to, with us to Adelaide that which we don't drink before Adelaide um, but of course we can't fly to Perth with any of this stuff and we can't fly home with any of it so 
you know. Well, I guess you can. Well, we could, but we're not doing that no. uh, with it all. So now we're going to go and look at what some of the other wineries look at. We're not going to really taste the wines because we've had enough tasting of it is. I've done the tasting anyways. Well, we'll just have a little snort, but... Um, I've just had a little tiny taste in my mouth because I don't want... Well, no, you're driving. Yeah, well, that, I don't want to start driving on the right-hand side. Well, no, <laughs> and I'd rather you didn't either. I only had a little taste uh, on each one, too. It wasn't... I didn't even bother to finish what they gave us. I just took a sip just to see. Um, so now Walter's looking for ones in this... I saw this other one that I, I saw. I don't know where I saw it, but it's the Alumba. And I just want to see where it is. The Alumba. And then I wouldn't mind going to Wolf Glass because they, we can get some of the Wolf Glass oh, yeah. out. And I just want to see what it looks like there. Yeah, now we're picking the wineries by what they look like outside. You can tell we're fine connoisseurs of wines, right? So anyways, we will continue the adventure in wine country. Okay. So that takes me to events in the past week. Uh, yeah, I didn't do much. Worked on that uh, table runner. Did we go anywhere? Mm. We went to the new Costco, as I already mentioned, um, on Saturday, which is not the best day of the week to go to a Costco. But then any day of the week, it's busy. But actually, it wasn't too bad, given that it's a brand new store. You figure everybody be flocking to it for the sales. Um, we did buy lobster tails. Um, they have a brand of frozen lobster tails that are a really good price. I think you get five relatively large lobster tails in a bag for $30. I mean, lobster's expensive, but they haven't had them since last December. That's when we got them last. Well, we happened to take a look. Every time we're in the Costco, we see if we can get some more because we kicked ourselves last time. They were so good, we should have bought a couple of bags because that price for what you're getting is pretty good for lobster tails. Um, lo and behold, this Costco had them. So we did buy a couple of bags. And on Saturday night, we had surf and turf here at home. Walter did the sh uh, shrimp. I was going to say shrimp, not shrimp. Lobster tails in the sous vide, as he did with the steak. And that's the perfect way to cook them. They come out absolutely wonderful. They were easy to get out of the, the shell. Walter took them out before he put them in the sous vide. And uh, no fishy smell, which, you know, if you smell fish, then you know it's not fresh kind of a thing absolutely delicious they were i love lobster um the one thing i hate about lobster is trying to get it out of the lobster when you get a whole lobster or something and with these you don't have to worry about it because they came right out of the tail shell and they were perfect absolutely perfect so that was the highlight of the week i guess doing that buying that um we bought a few other things at Costco, but the usual kind of staples and stuff, you know, that you buy in 45-gallon drum and send in crates. <laughs> kind of stuff. Yeah, speaking of which, we bought toilet paper. It was on sale. Okay, at Costco. Um, still have that fear, you know. Back when COVID first started, the run on toilet paper. What does our world come to? Anyways, yeah, there wasn't anything else I can think of that we did that was too exciting last week. So what's coming up? Well, the doors, windows and doors are now pretty much all ordered. We've got that all figured out. We're just finalizing what we're going to have for door handles. And uh, surprisingly, the price is less than I figured. I was anticipating about $25,000 for this because, I mean, we're replacing two doors, a huge transom over the doors, and one, two, three, four windows and also inserts uh well they're not inserts in, in the windows but the we have these quarter moon cutout shapes over above our living room windows and they're custom order don't you know of course they are so that and um well those two little windows are forty three hundred dollars each each you think they were made out of gold they're not in fact they are not anything really except for the shape special you know they're basically plain glass um they're not fancily etched or anything like that they're just glass yeah forty three hundred dollars because they're a specialty item whereas our two double front doors with glass inserts in the whole bit 
was about 9,000. So, yeah. But anyways, total price came in at 18,000. 7,000 less than I anticipated, which is good. I mean, it's still expensive, yeah. But, you know, the only thing I fear now is, well, when are they going to put them in? Because they've given us a timeline of from 6 to 12 weeks or so. I suspect it's going to be later than sooner because this is a busy time of the year for them. And we're not in any rush. It's just that I don't fancy having new windows and doors put in in the middle of December kind of a thing. So we'll see how that all works out. But yeah. And of course, one thing leads to another, doesn't it? Next thing is, there are some other things, some major things that we really need to have done to this house. We've been here 27 years. I mean, we've done decorating and painting many times over in the 27 years and that. But one thing that we definitely need is new floors in our front foyer and in all our bathrooms because those are the original floors from 27 years ago. And quite frankly, they look like crap. So, yeah. And then there's such a thing as new carpeting in certain parts of the house. And yeah, ka-ching, 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 ka-ching. So we'll just deal with this right now. And uh, those other things down the road at some point. I need another relative to drop dead that can leave me lots of money, but I'm out. <laughs> Nobody left, so yeah. Okay, so that's what we're doing. And just a reminder, the International Stitch Marathon happens on July the 22nd, Friday, July the 22nd, starting at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Come and go as you please. Get caught up on some projects. And yeah, details are in my show notes for all of that. Okay. So I think that takes me to the end of today's uh, episode. And uh, yeah, I hope you have a good week. I hope the weather's great. Uh, I hope it's nice summer weather for those of you that live in the Northern Hemisphere and, and whatnot. And yeah, have a good week. We'll see you later. Bye-bye.